more participants. So we have uh, Kirill Bogele, Garcia Labe today, uh, giving a talk. And she wrote a master thesis on studies of planetary nebula and is now making her PhD at the University of Cape Town and is a, a member of the South African Astronomical Observatory. Um, she gave an excellent talk at the South African Conference for High Energy Astrophysics, a really nice event. Uh, you should kind of try to participate more. Um, her current work focuses on X-ray binaries with a specific interest in neutron star low mass X-ray binaries um, and a focus to uh, understanding the accretion disk jet coupling mechanisms. Okay. Um, thank you very much. You want to share your screen? Just start. Oh, you should mention that mm -hmm. if anybody wants to meet her at 10 a.m., I think uh, FIM is organizing a Zoom meeting, yeah. you could join. And at 11 a.m., DeAndrea is organizing one, you could join that. Yes, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, I'll put it up on our screen. Can you see that? Yep. You only see the screen, right? Not the panel of participants. It's presenter view at this point. Yeah, I think we still see all your, uh, yeah. Okay, now, now it's full screen. Okay, great. Good day. Um, as it was introduced, I am Kilebukhile Khasialawe, a first year PhD student with the University of Cape Town and affiliated with the South African Astronomical Observatory. My supervisors are Dr. Idumeleng Munacheng, Prof. Rob Fender, and Prof. Patrick Vogt. My talk today is titled um, Neutron Star X ray Binaries with Meerkat. But before I go into that, I would like to start and give a brief overview of my previous research, which was in a different field. In case anyone is interested and would like to know a little bit more, they can feel free to contact me on my email afterwards. Is it changing? Is it changing slides? It is not. There you go. Now? Thanks. So my master's project was monitoring central stars of planetary nebulae, and this was in search of binary central stars. Planetary nebulae form when the star ejects material off the surface after the asymptotic giant branch. This ionized material that is blown off is the glowing nebula, which is mostly observed to be spherical in shape and morphology. However, many planetary nebulae are seen to have jets, uh, multipolarity, disks, rings, and other features. So over the past decades, it's been argued uh, what the mechanisms responsible for these features are. Uh, those are stellar rotation, magnetic fields, and binaries. The first two mechanisms mostly fail as seen observationally because the field strengths do not last long enough, so won't be able to maintain or sustain these morphologies. But with observational evidence and discoveries over the past decade, binaries have been the most favored scenario. So for my project, I looked at salt spectroscopy and then also test photometry of three objects. They all have wolf ray central stars, multipolarity in all three of them. The first two have dual dust chemistry and the last two offset central stars, which are suspected to be a result of binaries. But although we could not verify in the end of uh, the project that they have binary central stars, our quantitative time series analysis was able to constrain the orbital period parameter 
to then exclude short periods. These are less than 10 days, orbital periods. So that's if any binaries are present and are the cause for these kinds of, um, these very interesting features. Like I said, um, if anyone is interested and would like to learn, learn more details about this project, um, feel free to contact me. I am also um, almost ready to submit a, a paper for this. So here's an overview of the main talk. I will discuss X-ray binaries and then more specifically neutron star X-ray binaries. And then I will discuss the radio X-ray correlation. Introduce my current research, our results so far and our next steps and the future work. And then I will give you a nice summary. X-ray binaries comprise of a compact object primary, which can be a black hole or either a neutron star and a companion, which is your donor star. So depending on the size of the donor, the XRB can be classified as either low mass or high mass. When an X-ray binary undergoes an outburst, what happens is the mass transfer rate then surpasses the accretion rate onto the primary component. During this process, the temperature of the disk rises as the viscosity thereof increases. And then the higher central mass accretion rate then triggers a bright central X-ray source. And that is the outburst. The accretion rate now exceeds the binary mass transfer rate, so the mass of the disk then decreases and cools off. This is a continuous cycle, which for black hole systems is illustrated through the hardness intensity diagram, which is what you see here. Going from right to left, so in the first section, sources are in the low luminosity, this is the this is the low hard X-ray state region where you have a larger inner disk radius and a steady jet. And then in the second section, sources move in the hard part of the very high intermediate state. In this phase, the jet is still persisting and the inner disk radius decreases. And then through the third section, sources approach the jet line, then reaching the highest Lorentz factor. And then the soft state, the soft part rather, of the very high intermediate state is reached in the last section. This, section. this is the high soft state where there is no jet observed and the inner disk radius is at its most minimal as close to the, to the central source. The outbursts in black holes slightly different to neutron differ to neutron star X-ray binaries. And here they are known as X-ray bursts. So there are two types of X-ray bursts, type one and type two. I'll later show an example of the type one burst with my results. So in type one bursts, when in close proximity with extreme and with, with extreme gravity from the neutron star, the donor companion overflows its Roche lobe, and then hydrogen is drawn in the accretion disk around the neutron star. So this hydrogen on the surface of the neutron star immediately converts to helium due to the extreme temperatures and pressure and then therefore creating this thin layer. When this material builds up to a critical mass, it ignites explosively. And these are these thermonuclear bursts, which occur typically in the systems where the companion is a low mass um, main sequence like star. The signature of type one burst profiles are seen through the rapid rise and then the slow decline in the light curves of the sources. 
And then in type two bursts, instead of the thermonuclear flashes, the burst is linked to accretion instabilities. They are thought to be due to an increase in the accretion rate from the companion donor star and are seen to maintain a constant temperature for the duration of the burst. For type two bursts, um, they are distinguished from the type one burst through the burst profile. Also, in this case, the burst starts and then stops abruptly. And there's no sort of gradual decline from the peak. And these, these bursts also occur and are seen to occur in rapid succession of each other. So during the outburst and X-ray bursts described, there is a continuous cycle of disk and jet production. This coupling is investigated through the radio X-ray correlation. In black hole low mass X-ray binaries, when this is in the hard spectral state, a nonlinear correlation is observed between the radio and the X-ray luminosities. This is described, as I said, as the radio X-ray correlation. In this plane, sources follow two tracks, and these are called the standard track, also known as radio loud uh, sources, and the outlier track, which is in the more radio quiet region or radio quieter region compared to the standard track. There are some scenarios proposed for the different tracks. One is that a physical difference in the disk jet coupling may be responsible where the inner accretion flow or prop accretion flow or properties of jets might differ between the two tracks. And perhaps also um, another, another property or difference might be the geometric effects. And this was then suggested by Mota et al. Uh, in 2019 paper that such that in such instances, low inclination sources could appear radio louder due to ge ge geometry and then also Doppler boosting. So they lie on the, they end up lying on the standard track. This is an example sort of schematic of the radio X-ray plane from the hard spectral state to quies down to quiescence with X-ray luminosities in the one to 10 keV energy band. And then for, with the radio luminosities, they are plotted or, or, or put on the plane for five gigahertz and the rate and these luminosities range between 10 to the power of 32 to power of 39 for the x-ray and then 10 to the 25 to 10 to the 31 um, x per second for the for the radio now for neutron stars a similar relation is observed Previously, this was thought to be due to this was thought to be twofold that of the black holes in logarithmic space. However, studies with now larger data sets over these wider luminosity ranges show that the correlation for neutron stars are more similar to the black holes than what was initially thought. So neutron stars do not have an event horizon and they are less radio loud than the black holes. So this result shows that there's a little more to learn about these systems. A paper by Van Eyenden et al. this year, earlier this year, compiled a radio sensors of neutron star X-ray binaries um, they did include both low mass and high mass systems, which were a combination of weakly and strongly magnetized systems. So these are just uh, 
be filled less than 10 to the power of 10,000 for the weekly and then greater than the 10 to the 10 um, Gauss for the strongly magnetized. So those authors um, confirm that strongly magnetized sources are radio fainter than weakly magnetized ones as observed in the radio X-ray correlation. And this then suggesting that including high mass systems in accretion models could along with the jet quenching describe the radio louder systems. That's from the Can radio quiet one. Sorry? Can I ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, so when on the on the previous slide when you show the two tracks, uh, are is it that uh, some sources will fall or some of these systems will fall on one track and some systems will fall on the other track? Or is it so uh, that the same system sometimes shows up on one track or the other? Um, actually, it's been seen that there's a few sources that are thought or called um, hybrid systems where they first start on the standard track um, from the high end of this plane and then fall towards the outlier track and then somehow make their way back to the standard track. So it's still a little um, not really uh, understood why there is the separate track system and why some, some objects tend to sit mainly on the different tracks. But now with this, um, I think there's about four systems possibly within this hybrid um, status. So it's, it's, it's still questionable um, why or where the sources in, will end up. Thank you. Um, I was saying here that the authors from this paper suggest that including high mass systems in accretion models could, along with the jet quenching, describe the radio louder systems from the more quiet ones, or alternatively, um, separating low mass and high mass systems to different correlation plots could bring a a bit or more clearer understanding for the different groups. So I will now discuss my current research and how it ties into these concepts. The aim of my project is to establish a radio X-ray correlation for neutron star uh, low mass X-ray binaries, therefore then adding to the current populace, population such that the black hole and neutron star low mass X-ray binaries can be compared so that we can develop a more universal understanding of this disk jet coupling, or at least get a step closer to that. So I am examining radio data taken with Meerkat. This is the SKA precursor, which is set in the Karoo of South Africa which consists of 64 dishes um, that are 13.5 meters in diameter with observations taken mostly in the L band. This is at uh, 1.28 gigahertz. So the data that I have was taken as part of the Thundercat large survey project. This is the image plane monitoring survey of transients with Meerkat. I'm also examining X-ray data in collaboration with SWIFT. And my sample of objects so far include SACS J1808.4 and Circinus X1. So the first one, uh, SACS J1808, it was initially discovered in 1996 with the BIPO SACS satellite which was as, a, as an X-ray source. And then a detection of 401 hertz, um, hertz pulsations 
1998 made this source the first known accreting millisecond X-ray pulsar. So millisecond pulsars are low magnetic field um, of approximately 10 to the power of eight Gauss neutron stars that emit pulsed radiation with a periodicity ranging between one to one to 10 milliseconds. And the AMXP of SACS J1808 has a periodicity of about two and a half milliseconds. So the source is located at an estimated distance of 3.5 kiloparsecs, and it has an orbital period of about two hours with uh, the short semi-regular outburst recurrence times of two to four years. And its most recent outburst was then in mid-2019. And then secondly, for Circinus X1, this was um, initially thought to be a black hole X-ray binary. Uh, this is because of the X-ray uh, spectral and timing similarities it has to Cygnus X1, which is in fact a, a high mass X-ray binary. And then later, however, with the discovery of type one X-ray bursts, therefore indicating the primary component is a neutron star. This was confirmed decades later um, that with the detection by RXTE. And then we can also say that Cessna X1 um, has an extensive nebula surrounding it. This is powered by the continuing jet action of the system. And it is observed to go into these regular outbursts that occur every about 16 and a half days. Uh, next, we have some results of these um, outbursts for these, for these two sources, what I've done so far. Uh, first is the Sachs J1808 out, um, 2019 outburst. This was observed for six epochs with an average of about 61 antennas for each observation. The outburst was monitored nearly weekly. Uh, this was from the 31st of, of, Ju of July to the 31st of August. And they were for a duration of 15 minutes each. And then of the six epochs, the first two were seen as non-detections. Um, these are these two over here. And then the source was then detected from the third epoch. And this was on the 10th of August. The imaging was processed with OxCat. This is, um, this is a semi-automated data processor. Uh, it makes use of CASA. Uh, the data was averaged and flagged. And then the scripts um, for cross and self calibration were performed and then using the tri-color and WS clean packages. The data was then imaged and after which for the process of um, OxCAD and its scripts, there was further self calibration and the flux measurements were then for the source determined with pi BDSF. This is the radio light curve. And here I indicate the RMS um, upper limits for those two non-detections and then the subsequent outburst. And as I mentioned earlier with the type one X-ray bursts, um, they have this steep rise and then the slow decline. So this is sort of an example of what these um, type one burst profiles look like. So then similarly, the outburst was observed with SWIFT XRT. This was quasi simultaneously between that period. Um, there were 21 observations of which only nine were observed during that 31st July to uh, around 1st of September. 
from those observations, um, the source was detected in five epochs. The spectra was extracted and fitted for only, for only those spectra above a 0.6 uh, keV energy. And this was done using extraction tools and processes, which are standard um, from SWIFT. The source was observed to go um, from a main outburst and then to a reflaring event. The X-ray main outburst is seen on the 12th of August initially. And on the 10th of August, the jet then switches on as seen in the radio. So a report on the optical observations taken with uh, Las Cumbres, this was by uh, Baglio et al 2020. They showed the peak of the outburst was first reached around the 11th of August. So this was in optical. So the outburst was seen first in the radio and then the optical and then the X-ray. So the optical report authors, uh, they also confirmed that the source uh, stays in the hard state as it goes from this main outburst to the reflaring event, which was from their results on the 24th of August. Uh, this is about this region. Unfortunately, not observed, not observed with SWIFT over here, but uh, from our radio data, it is some, it is, it is reflected uh, as we notice this increase in flux density towards this last epoch. Unfortunately, not um, observed after that time. So to determine a radio X-ray correlation based on these results, um, we assumed a flat spectral index. So the meerkat observations were taken at a 1.28 gigahertz. I therefore converted that the flux densities uh, to luminosity using a five gigahertz frequency so that we are able to compare this to the previous measurements on the radio X-ray plane. The X-ray luminosities are displayed on the right. And these are based on flux measurements within the one to 10 keV band with SWIFT. As I mentioned, um, this X-ray data was taken quasi simultaneously with the radio data. And we were therefore able to correlate the luminosities. Uh, this was within a delta T of about two days of the MJDs. And this then resulted in three detections from the four radio ones and the five X-ray ones. And these ended up matching as indicated over here. The radio um, X-ray correlation plane is, is then displayed now. Uh, this is in log space and the different classes of X-ray binaries are respectively indicated in the legend. But for the purpose of this project, I, I draw your attention to the accreting millisecond pulsars. Uh, these neutron star X-ray binaries, which are observed to be less radio loud than the black hole systems. And um, these are the pink stars. And then for SACS J1808, being the cornerstone of that class is consistent um, with the other AMXP sources. The previous outbursts for SACS J1808 are indicated in the red stars. And then the three points from our results are boldly indicated here with the green stars. So the results we have are consistent with previous outburst results. And then to now compare this to the black hole distribution, uh, the black hole correlation for the standard track, a slope for best fit was made. 
this beta for sex j1808 2019 outburst is approximately it comes out to be approximately 0 0.7 which is a 0.1 difference in steepness to the black hole correlation which is about approximately 0 0.6 also seen in um, most literature so we are comparing a fit of only three points here. But from what we see from these neutron star systems, it does appear to sit mainly in the, or what, what we know as the outlier regime of the black hole tracks that I mentioned earlier. Um, therefore, there must be some kind of physical or similar physical process occurring in both systems. Now to go on to Circinus X1, just briefly, the most recent um, report of radio observations for this source was done with CAT7. This, um, this was the first phase of, the, of Meerkat, and then also it was um, observations were done with uh, Hardreo. Uh, this is a single dish uh, a single dish telescope, 26 meters in diameter. The figure on the right is from that report where they indicated the flare events as observed from the different instruments. The top panel is the radio light curves and the X-ray light curves at the bottom, which was taken from Maxi within the two to 20 keV band. And then from this, we note that Circinus X1 has type one bursts as well. And just confirming that from our previous, our previous literature and the outbursts mildly coincide um, between the radio and the X-rays from what we see from these, um, these results. And then so earlier this year, we had a few observations of the source with Meerkat and noticed they were, they ended up being at very similar points of each cycle, um, which did not reveal much um, for us to be able to determine the variability in these outbursts. Um, here is an image from the first of those outbursts, or the first of those observations rather, um, the imaging processes here was very similar to that done with uh, SACS J1808's data. And for this object reveal this nebula around the source identified here. This is the central source and at the bottom is um, what is thought to be part of one of the, the jet lobes. What's the field of view here? Um, I'd have to double check that. I can, I can get back to you later. Okay. Um, so like I was saying, because of how the observations were spaced out, we wanted to observe potentially for a full cycle and with the opportunity, we're able to have a 34 day observing campaign, which was then able to include two full cycles. This campaign started on the 3rd of August um, and ran straight through to the 5th of September um, earlier this year or a few months ago. Um, these were meerkat observations and then we also did the quasi-simultaneous observations with SWIFT for the X-ray data. But for the purpose of comparing the radio to the X-ray, I continue here with maxi data instead, since our SWIFT data has not been reduced um, since the maxi, and since the maxi data is just readily available uh, publicly. So over here, I present the light curve taken. This is over a period from the first observation in May this year till this um, 5th of September observation. The X-ray light curve at the bottom is in count rates 
in the taken from the 2 to 20 keV energy band and then the flux densities from from the radio is in the top panel where the flux was then also was then measured here in CASA instead of um, the pi BDSF method method I mentioned earlier for the other object and here are the first few observations um, taken earlier this year and you can notice here how they ended up sort of at the or same or similar point of the outburst cycle. Um, a very interesting coincidence. And then at the right end over here um, are from this 34 day campaign confirming the outburst profile once again and similar to the Armstrong et al. 20, 2013 results, the radio and X-ray outburst appear to coincide very closely. So from the second burst um, of the radio data, we have this outlier at the peak, um, but um, it's it's this this we don't have any worry there because within the error bars it matches quite closely to the previous peak. So now using these results, I determined the luminosities once again. In this case, I also assumed a flat spectral index and therefore converted those. Um, luminosities using a 5 gigahertz frequency for the radio and then for the x-ray I used a 4 to 10 keV energy band. Um, this is for the x-ray. Uh, therefore for these results I do stress that it's just a pre preliminary check um, to see what we sort of can expect. So on the radio X-ray correlation, the source is placed here at the at the higher end, um, the more radio loud region, indicating a weakly magnetized source, which is expected given the strong jets that are observed in um, that are observationally observed in the source in the images. And then just going back to the Armstrong authors, they discussed that if the brightenings in the source is due to an increase in the power of the jet um, because of changes in the accretion rate or changes uh, or changing Doppler boosting. Um, this would pro probably be due to a varying um, angle of the line of sight. But they then concluded that um, an increase in the jet power is more likely due to the changing accretion rate than the apparent than this apparent jet variations which were at the time not possible to fully test however now with our daily epochs of our daily epochs of data um, these jet variations are more possible to test therefore in terms of what is next for our future work um, and to, for this analysis, we will be looking or creating a deep image for the epochs of data that we have. And from that, we'll be able to subtract each uh, daily epoch and then to determine if there is any variability on those day-to-day uh, -day timescales of the extended jet region and then finally infer anything that could indicate the mechanisms responsible for the disk jet coupling observed uh, once this is once the swift spectral analysis is conducted and luminosity measurements are taken within the 1 to 10 keV band instead of the 4 to 10 keV band And so I will finally summarize and then conclude. So X-ray binaries have 
compact primaries. Um, these are either your black holes or your neutron stars, and they have low mass or high mass companions. The outbursts are slightly different in the two systems where in the neutron stars, uh, their low mass systems typically undergo thermonuclear burst flashes and the other systems have uh, accretion instabilities. During these bursts, there is a cycle of accretion and disk production. And to investigate this relation, the radio X-ray correlation of sources is studied. The neutron star distribution is observed to lie in this similar region um, as the second track of the black hole systems, uh, known as that outlier track. And then the first track is um, known as the standard track, which was the radio louder systems. Uh, my project is, the, was there, is therefore um, to develop this correlation for neutron star low mass systems such that it is comparable to the black hole low mass, low mass distributions. So through Meerkat radio data and SWIFT X-ray data, uh, under, this Thunder, under the Thundercat project, I've constructed the X-ray, the radio X-ray correlation for SACS J1808. Um, 2019 outburst, and then for Circinus X1's outburst this year, uh, which is still a preliminary result. Both sources, um, as I've said, are low mass systems, and they show type one X-ray bursts in their light curve profiles. The outburst for SACS J1808, uh, this occurs about every two to four years. And then for Cisna 6 one just a reminder that it's every 16 and a half days. And then for our results, the SACS J1808 in the, in the X-ray correlation plane, um, it's, it's in the expected region of its AMXP class. Um, although with only three points, we related these results to the black hole distribution and found a 0.1 difference in the slope such that the black hole distribution is less steep. And we were then also able to place this in a 6 one on the on the plane as a preliminary result, but uh, we did not determine a best fit since this analysis is still ongoing. It does, however, for now reveal that the source lies in the more higher end of the plane uh, with a closer relation from what we see to the standard track and not the outlier track or rather both. Um, so with regards to future work for the source, given our dense data set, uh, we are planning to make a very beautiful deep image, hopefully that will come out really nicely. And then um, with subtraction images, be able to infer if there is variability with regards to this, um, to the extended jet emission observed in the nebula. Uh, therefore, to conclude, the disk jet coupling is suspected to stem from accretion flow and jet production properties. Um, it is difficult uh, to relate these sources because jets do tend to appear differently in different sources. Um, and therefore, however, uh, continuous development of the X-ray correlation can sort of help answer some questions. And hopefully by the end of this project, I would have contributed immensely to the field. Um, and I look forward to really great results. With that, I would like to end here and I thank you all for attending. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I have a question, um, and, and first of all, that was a that was a fantastic talk, um, and thank you for making the time. Um, 
You, you mentioned um, in the third section that you see uh, radio loudness inversely correlated with uh, magnetic field strength. Higher magnetic fields are more radio quiet and, and lower magnetic fields are more radio loud. Mm -hmm. um, and and you, you may have explained this and, and it just went over my head, but that's kind of the opposite of what I would expect. Is there a physical explanation for that? Is it that the higher the magnetic field that that synchrotron radiation is pushed up into a higher energy band or, or, or why should that be the case? Because that's perhaps naively the opposite of what I would have expected. Um, actually, also, I was asking the same question. Um, so it appears that the strongly magnetic field sort of obstructs the, the jet. So it ends up uh, coming less or radio quiet in these strongly magnetic fields. I'm not exactly sure of the, the complete physical process that happens, but um, yeah, that's just the short answer that the stronger magnetic field tends to eat up the jet somehow. Thank you. I'm sure if you can hear me, so let me know if I, if I should speak up more, but did Madam explain it, but I, oh, maybe I didn't catch it. Is there a mechanism for why there's a difference between the standard track and the outlier track, or do we know why there's those two different trends? Um, it's been, it's been modeled or suspected with uh, the, there's this l luminously hot um, accretion flow model and the advection dominated uh, model where they suspect that these radio or radio loud, radio quieter systems would tend to follow the luminously hot um, accretion accretion um, flow systems. Um, I have to read a little more into depth about these models um, to answer you fully, but there are some some speculations as to as to why we have these different um, tracks and the possible physic physical properties um, occurring in them which can be inferred um, from the disk temperatures and viscosities from these models. I see, thank you. If you look at the like, time lags between the vulnerability in X-ray and radio. Uh, sorry, repeat that. Have you looked into time offsets between the variability? If the X-ray kind of the disk causes the jet, you may Maybe there's like the X-ray proceeds the uh, wave availability. Um, I haven't, um, but that is something to look into. Um, I've only really been doing this project for about seven months and it's a completely different field. So there's a little more that I need to look into. Yes, that is, um, I'd look into the time, the time delays. Thanks. Jim uh, on Zoom. Yeah, one, one thing that occurs to me, I was just reading a little about Meerkat offline and it, it's very, it covers a very broad frequency range from 500 megahertz up to, yeah, I don't know, 10-ish gigahertz. Do you get, um, when you take data, do you get simultaneously get data in all of those frequency bands or are like some of the receivers up and some of them aren't or, um, um, yeah, it. I guess it. It depends on the proposal. Mm -hmm. In in most cases, um, you do get um, some or a few of these um, different bands mm -hmm. with your with your data. Um, but yes, it does happen sometimes that some receivers are off. Um, mm -hmm. Like right. with with the sex J eighteen oh eight data, um, the approximately only 61 of the 64 antennas were working in mm -hmm, most mm -hmm. in most cases so right so yeah. it's not as trivial as one would think because what i was thinking is going kind of to henrik's question also looking at time lags between the different radio frequency bands could be very interesting like you mm -hmm. know is this a, is this synchrotron is it 
self-absorbed, you know, so do the, you know, do the higher frequencies lag the lower frequencies or things like that. I think those could mm. be interesting, interesting yeah, studies. Yeah. Um, the, I guess, and sorry, just one other quick question. How, I mean, this is really like an amazing <laughs> observatory for like, also like semi-extended sources, you know, like your planetary nebula or supernova remnants or whatever. How does mm-hmm. one get time on the, this observatory? I mean, is it is there a process by which people in the U.S. community can can get time? Or um, I think well, the, right now there's mostly the their large um, their large survey surveys. Yeah, right. That's your your Thundercat and. Um, Mongoose, La Duma, looking mm-hmm. into the deep field for um, for galaxies. So those are probably so like I, primary science programs that nominate the schedule for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. So at the moment, I think they're mostly focusing on those projects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for anything sort of outside of that, um, I guess DDT proposals can be submitted. Um, but I'm not sure of the process. So they must be served. I saw, you know, some of the early results on the galactic center region, which are just insanely beautiful. <laughs> there must be similar results along the galactic plane now. Do you know how much of the, the plane has been surveyed or? Um, I, I don't know exactly how much of it has been surveyed, but I know there is currently a project where they are cross-matching um, and overlaying uh, the different the different bands, um, radio and optical, mm-hmm. and using some some Gaia distances. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about the exact number, but there is an ongoing project right now that I oh, know of. Lots of yeah. stuff coming, I would imagine, in the coming years. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So... For your 1808 uh, light curve, what was the limit for following it? It just, did the proposals run out of observations? Uh, did the sun get in the way? And you know, how much fainter could you have gone uh, to follow that correlation down to the low rolling velocities? Because that's where it really starts getting interesting uh, as you get the separation wider between those two tracks and see if there's any differences between neutron stars and uh, black holes as they get very faint. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure how faint it went, but at the time, um, it was sort of the start of the, of the meerkat observations. And so I suppose that these were just, they were just given sort of a quick look um, quick look um, time frames. And that's why we, we kind of, I feel like we kind of missed out for this reflaring event. Um, sort of observe it a little more further down to the quiescence of the source at the time. So, you know, one suggestion is that in addition to, to SWIFT, um, the nicer uh, instrument on board the space station uh, mm-hmm. could fill in points when Swift is not looking and uh, potentially could go down a factor of 10 or 30 times fainter uh, than you have here. So if you get to see this again, you could follow that for another decade. Uh, yeah. That, that's worth, worth looking into. And uh, the nicer deadline for uh, proposed observations is about two and a half weeks. So that's worth for you and Rob uh, Fender to think about. Uh, we'll mm-hmm. come back and, and do this project again and fill in more, you know, ask for both Swift and NICER and really fill in that light curve and, and take another decade or a decade and a half uh, down with uh, a combination of those two and see if it's on the same track again and, and how much further that extends. Yeah. And I mean, there's at least probably two more outbursts within the next decade. But you, you do have about two and a half weeks to 
uh, to start arranging that or uh, anything that happens this year. It's worth thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, I have a question for this slide. So it seems like the luminosity is not the same in the X-ray band and in the radio. So is that is there any reason? I thought that it should be same for the same source, right? Uh, yes. You, you sorry, you are saying uh, the luminosity doesn't appear to be the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, it it in most cases, um, well, it's it's been observed that the neutron stars are less luminous than the black hole systems. Um, and this this is in the hard spectral state mostly, so it's it is a bit of a, it's a bit of an expected result um, from the literature that the yeah the, the radio luminosity um, is fainter. Thank you. In the uh, in the X ray. Uh, I I had a question on your radio to x-ray uh diagrams what does uh, the, this one yes yeah on this one so so if you have the three star points mm -hmm. what is carrying the most important information for you the slope that the three points have or whether they are on the top track or the bottom track um the most important result here is that first um it, the source is kind of where we expect it to be based on the previous results. And then also from the steepness of the slopes, it also sort of puts more uh, distinctness, distinctness um, between the two tracks. Because I, I saw for so because this is, so the, the, the stars here are observations that you took at 1.4 gigahertz and you extrapolate it to 5 gigahertz right um yes so 1.2 to 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 5. yeah and for the circinus x radio light curve that you take at several frequencies uh you see that the radio spectrum changes as the flare goes on right because uh i guess if you go farther to the it's yeah so here, for instance, uh, on the second flare, you see that the red points are below the purple points at the mm -hmm. rising edge, but then they go above the purple points on the on the falling edge, which means that the, the radio spectrum is is changing as the flare evolves, right? Yes. So so yeah, I I wonder if if that's something that is reproducible so that you can correct for that when you have to extrapolate, uh, or or whether you can ignore that because what you really care about is the overall slope rather than where they land. Um, you do want to um, make sure, because see with the other one, um, we were able to assume a flat spectral index, but with these ones, when it's very noticeable that for the different fre frequencies, um, the flux densities are sort of at different um, different measurements, you do want to determine a spectral in a spectral index for for these three frequencies, and then from that um, use for the conversion to five gigahertz. Um, so there's there's a there's a little more calculation that would go into into something like this, but for right now with the with the with this one, I just initially assumed um, a flat spectral index, but with more precise measurements, then you would have to um, yeah determine the spectral index using these three these three different um, frequency points. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? Well, we can thank our speaker again.